<laughs> All right. Good day and welcome with that doleful countdown. Welcome to uh, this week's edition of The Week That Was, which is not nearly as serious a show as that stupid the countdown. countdown. That would, would be like for Scientology show. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Uh, Deadline Detroit is dead, but the week that was lives on because we enjoy doing it and we uh, serve an audience of tens. And uh, we don't want to let those hundreds, down. hundreds, exactly. Hundreds, hundreds. I am Nancy Derringer filling in for the um, peripatetic uh, Saeed Khan, who's out racking up more frequent flyer miles as we speak. And I am joined today by uh, our usual cast of semi-regulars. Uh, we've got uh, political consultant Adolf Mongo down there in your uh, in the southwest or southeast portion of your screen. Uh, free free press political columnist and man about town ML Elric, uh, the world's greatest uh, criminal defense lawyer, at least the one world greatest one in uh, Metro Detroit, Steve Fisherman. My former colleague, Alan Lengel, and I think that is the panel today, isn't it? Yes. yes okay. Yes. Well, and as usual, it has been a week. A week. Did I just want to? I just want to stop for one second, though, and point out, Alan, did you see how long thirty seconds was in that stupid countdown that we that yes. that comes with the software? That's yeah. what I mean when I say make your video clips tighter. So all anyway, right, we'll get to that in a minute. I, Nancy is never, you know. <laughs> About Always be teaching. Lecturing me. But... <laughs> yeah, Nancy, are you single? Yeah. <laughs> no, sorry. Is that a coincidence? You seem like but you're high maintenance. I think my husband is deaf, though. No, I'm not high maintenance. <laughs> He's deaf. Yeah. But anyway. Um, She's opinionated. Okay. I'm opinionated. opinionated. We're all opinionated. And I'm not high maintenance. Um, that's a, that is like something that they say to uh, to women, and they just don't say it so much about men. Men are just you know mercurial or whatever, but women are always bitches. But well, Charlie Ladoff mentioned it to me. I don't know. Oh really? Okay. Yeah. I see. I see. He is really seriously gunning for that national spot that he thinks he deserves. This all this reporting from the border is just like. And and why do we need you down there, Charlie? But you know that's he's going to help build a wall. Oh yeah, he's going to help build the wall. So anyway, all right, let's talk about what what, uh, what the week brought us this week. Um, as long as we're talking about over long, overly long video clips, I think we really need to to start off with a smile. And Lengel, would you cue it up? Peter, Donald Trump announced yesterday he'd be making a major announcement today, which got everybody going. It's like, what's he going to do? Is he backing out of the race? Is he suing the Statue of Liberty? Who knows? <laughs> And there was a lot of speculations on, online. Some thought he maybe he was returning to Twitter or releasing the files on JFK or endorsing Ron DeSantis, choosing a running mate, starting his own political party, running for Speaker of the House. Well, it turned out to be none of those things. Trump's major announcement was this. Hello, everyone. This is Donald Trump, hopefully your favorite president of all time, better than Lincoln, better than Washington. Hornier than Kennedy. <laughs> Better than Taft, you name it. An important announcement to make. I'm doing my first official Donald J. Trump NFT collection right here and right now. They're called Trump Digital Trading Cards. These cards feature some of the really incredible artwork pertaining to my life and my career. It's been very exciting. You can collect your Trump Digital Cards just like a baseball card or other collectibles. Trading Yes, that is the former president of the United States of America appearing in some really badly photoshopped heroic image uh, digital trading cards that feature him looking about 100 pounds lighter and dressed as not only the ones we saw there as a spaceman, they also have him as a fighter pilot, a NASCAR <laughs> driver. Um, a what looks to be a football coach standing on the 45th yard line, get it 45, and several others. And the, it is truly, I mean, even the maggots that I follow on uh, social media were, um, if not dumbfounded by this. And what, what's this about? But I mean, anyone did anybody get a chance to page through those $99 digital trading cards? No, but you know who thought this would be a good idea? Him. No, this guy who got a marketing degree from Trump University. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. I mean, it's, it, it's 
it's amazing when you hear his name and he's trying to talk about Lincoln and, and Washington like he's in the same. It's just phenomenal. Better. It's better phenomenal. Than, better than them. Right. Or as Jimmy Kimmel said, hornier than Kennedy. Hornier than Kennedy. <laughs> We watched um, the we're H, we're HBO liberals, and so we watched the um, uh, what do I want to say the oh the Pelosi in the House uh, documentary on HBO, which I think dropped this week, and it is about what you would expect. It's made by her daughter Alexandria Pelosi, who's a filmmaker, and it is a loving portrait of her mother that was gathered over a course of years, and um, it's you know it's about what you would expect. But I was really, what I found surprising about it was my visceral reaction to seeing Trump again, because I've gotten used to him not being there anymore. And there's something about seeing him, you know, where, where he kind of like just out his lower teeth and he, and he has that stupid hand gesture that he does, the, the kind of like the okay, but it's squashed a little bit, or he waves his hand around like this. And it was just like, Ooh, it was just like a physical revulsion. But anyway, anybody else watch it? <laughs> I have, I have not watched that. Okay, I'm still waiting for the Pelosi Jim Jordan sex tapes to come out. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, as apparently a they were shot by his wrestling coach. <laughs> as a woman, I have to say the thing that I found most amazing. I mean, she is now what 82, Nancy Pelosi. She's at least 80. And she is still walking around uh, the House of Representatives in very high heels and not appearing to suffer from it. And that really says something. But. She's uh, she was very impressive. The video that was shown of her when the attack was happening and where she was just very calm and said, we've got to deal with this. We've got to. I mean, right. Chuck, Chuck Schumer was like a nervous Nelly and she was just really impressive yeah. just how she just hung in and there she, like she was like a quarterback the... in a there was a blitz and she's just kind of like oh let me see who's Back out the there pocket, looking can... for her. Yeah, yeah yeah she was she was very she was very calm and she was very chill and uh it was great to hear her say you know to talking on the phone and she's talking about how these guys these invaders were like shitting in the halls and, you know, she's, like, and she's saying in the, in the halls They're of Congress, crapping like, in the halls oh, she's going and apparently there's just poo poo all over down there <laughs> I thought, just poo poo you know you just gotta love that stuff so anyway all right uh, i noticed that bill cycli who was with us last week uh, said that Trump's ability to keep us talking about him is quite something. And I, I get the feeling that's all that's all this is about. But let's move on. We we have a new president now. and uh, Luckily, we didn't fall into that trap. Yeah, yeah, right. yeah right. Um, This week was the official signing of the defensive marriage. Actually, what what is it called? What's the, mar the new marriage act, the LGBT and interracial marriage protection it has another name i forget whatever he signed the law uh, protecting gay and interracial marriages um in part which was passed fairly quickly in part because uh clarence thomas uh shook his finger at it during the uh in in the dobbs decision and said this is something he wanted to take another look at so well he did he didn't. He didn't say he wanted to take a look at interracial marriage. No, not interracial, because he's in that. one. But I was very glad to see the statute passed because now, after 37 years, I think it is, my wife and I have been married. It's nice to know that I, we're legal. All yeah. these years, here, <laughs> I was waiting for another Loving versus Virginia case, and now I know that thanks to the Congress and thanks to the president who signed it, I'm legal. Good. I'm. Gl <laughs> I'm glad to hear that. Um, I don't know. I've, I've, that's one, I have to say that's one wedding. I don't think I've been to yet. I feel like I've been to a wedding of every faith, but so far the gay people I know who've been married have done it in fairly quiet courthouse ceremonies and I've never been invited. Anybody here been to a gay wedding? You have? I have. What was it, it was like? A, uh, man, it was like a regular way. It was over at the, uh, what, the Fillmore. Okay. Uh, it was a it was a big to do. It was a big affair, and uh, yeah, men or just, women? Uh, it was two women. Uh, it was just you okay. know, no different really. Okay. I mean, there, so there you wasn't did... anything you know on 
You very, didn't need uh, Xanax for gay summer weddings then, which is the old, <laughs> the old SNL uh, spot, which I thought was, right. was really good. They were talking right, about right. how everyone's dressed so perfectly and, 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 and all of their, and, and the party favors were $10,000 and tickets to Paris. <laughs> how was yours, Steve? It was about the same, the same thing. It was two men. Uh-huh. But it, I mean, the, the wedding itself was the same. Huh. It's a different different crowd of people, I would say that. A little yeah. Bit, but, okay. But, you know. All right. No crowd of doves or clo or you know flock of doves re released at the uh, moment of truth. Anything like that? No, I didn't see anything like that. All right. Okay, you guys. Let's move on. Let's move on to the Crumblies. Um, this is the uh, uh, the prosecutor is digging in her heels and absolutely does not want any or the uh, the crumbly parents jennifer and james uh released on bond no matter what and there were a couple of great details in that story including the ones about their friend bj who was the one who was uh, who was volunteering to keep them but let's hear some legal opinions about the crumblies i mean they've been sitting in prison jail not prison jail for a year now is this i mean at some we, point we got murderers walking around the city that's out on bail. Right. I don't get it. Why why this prosecutor, Steve, you you the attorney, what, what she got a hard on for them. You would think they were serial killers. I, I think we talked about it a little bit last week when Bellotta was on with me. If this were in federal court, um, they'd have been on bond from the beginning because of the way in which federal court treats cases. The problem is in this case, it's it's the publicity and the press and Karen McDonald, for whatever reason, has kind of staked her claim. And this is the biggest case in the history of the world. Uh, personally, I've said this before on the show, and I, I would say it to her if I had a conversation with her. They've made the point. I don't disagree with charging them. I do not disagree with it. But they've made the point, and it's time to resolve that case. Give them a plea to something. And, and keep in mind, Nancy, when you say you corrected yourself from prison to jail, there's a huge difference. Mm -hmm. Between being in a penal institution and being in a jail, a jail, you sit on your ass most all the time. You might have your hour of exercise or whatever the hell it is. If you go to a penal institution, it might not be any fun, but at least you can get out and do things. You know, you can take classes, you can get out into the yard and, you know, you can exercise. It's just a completely different world than a penal institution. So when you sit in the county jail, which is where they've been, I view that and I have asked judges at times years ago when sentencing particularly in federal court, when they started sending people to county jails, I've asked the judges to consider it as two days for each one. That's how much different it is being in a jail. Huh. So what's their reaction? What's their reaction when you've asked that? The judges, they, what's their reaction? I don't know. You know, they, they, they give their sentence anyway. They never have said, you know, you're right, Mr. Fisherman. I'm going to reduce it. <laughs> but, I, but I do believe, I do believe that our, our judges, and remember, we've got an excellent bench here in the federal court. I think our judges take that into consideration because they know the difference between, because some of the judges, people who they sentence come back, you know, our town always did that. There's a number of our judges that do that. They come back and they tell the judge about their experience. And I think they do take it into consideration. They won't say it on the record, probably shouldn't because there's no real legal basis for it. But with the Crumblies, a year sitting in the county jail, and I just think it's enough. I think they should make a deal. The, gov the prosecutor should offer them something and then they should take it, which I can't imagine they wouldn't take it. And they should go home already. They've made the point. I, I, go ahead. I, I, have, I have mixed feelings about it. I mean, one, they tried to run. So I understand the concerns about them being uh, a fugitive. On the other hand, as Steve says, I mean, look, the prosecution's won already. Whether they lose the case or not, they've already got them for they've served a year of time. And who knows how much more they get for a conviction on involuntary manslaughter. They might get another year or two, but maybe not. And maybe time served. So it's it's there's kind of an injustice here because it's not clear whether it's not a slam dunk in terms of a conviction for them. And the prosecution's already basically said, you know, you're served one year already. And that's I'm not sure that's justice, really. So, well, I don't know. I mean, I think, you know, a, what is a typical sentence for this type of, inv well, this is a unique case because of the, the, you know, we're talking about their kid, but I mean, what is a typical sentence for involuntary manslaughter? Probably somewhere around three. 
Three. Okay. It's a, remember, we have indeterminate sentencing in this state, which I'm trying my best to change, but that's another issue for another day. Okay. Uh, three to 15. You, you have indeterminate sentencing. You have a minimum, you have a max. And in the state of Michigan, thanks to John Engler and those people back then, you don't get any good time and no halfway house. So if you get three years, you're there for three solid years and you leave three years after you went in. You get credit for time served is what Alan's talking about. So even if they were to receive what I, I, I think it's probably an average manslaughter sentence, three, they've done a third of it already in a county jail. Hmm. Okay. Did. Okay. So that's, I mean, I just, it seems as though these people are, I mean, you said they tried to run. Yeah, maybe they tried. I think they have, they tried to avoid arrest. And I think that I don't think they were actually lighting out for the territories. I mean, they came to Detroit for God's sake. Um, why not just put them on a tether? And, you know, they probably don't have a house to go back to because I think they were renting. But, you know, put them on a tether somewhere. I would think that would be, you know, secure enough for them. See, I, I, I think they need to resolve the case. See, all of this, this stuff is great for the media. You know, there's mm -hmm. some, this one files this, this one files that. The stuff that you guys saw in there about the person that they were going to live with. I mean, no judge would let a, somebody go to live with that guy. That's for sure. Right. Based on just what you read, assuming it's true, what they put in there. They need to resolve it. Forget bond or no bond. They should resolve the case. Give them a plea. Three weeks later, they'll get sentenced. It's not like federal court where it goes on for three and a half months. And then that's the end of the case. That's it. Then they, all this business about bond doesn't really matter. Give them something to plead to and make them a sentence bargain if you want to. To say, okay, we're going to sentence you to a year salary, one to whatever, and you get credit for the year you've been in. And then it's done with. The case yeah. should be over with. Yeah. Retai was talking about. Like, it does ahead. seem like since the kid has reached a plea, that the parent's case should be on some kind of fast track because that, that seemed to me to be the, the bigger, messier case. But maybe the prosecutor is trying to get her pound of flesh by keeping them behind bars as long as she can. Well, yeah, but keep in mind, Michael, you, you, the, the prosecutor can't keep anyone behind bars and the prosecutor can't keep the case from going to trial. I don't know anything about Oakland County Circuit Court. I don't even know who the judge is on the case. But if that judge looked at it the way you just said it, and I happen to agree with the way you just said it, the judge would clear his or her calendar and say, all right, look, January 15th, we're going to trial. I don't want to hear from either side about how, oh, my God, I'm too... You know, I, I, I'm not prepared. How could they not be prepared after a year? You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So it's really the judge. And I, the prosecutor can't control that. The judge, if it were in front of Judge with Tim Kenny, who's now retiring, if it was in front of Judge Kenny, this case had been tried already. I'm telling you. Hmm. Because that's what he would. That's what a, a good judge would just say, look, we're going to court. That's it. But now keep in mind, it's at the Supreme Court. So there's a delay that's not caused by the trial judge. Now they got to wait and see what the Supreme Court said. That's why they should make a deal. Sitting around waiting on the appellate courts, the, the people could sit there two years. In a well, she's, tr she's trying to squeeze all the PR out of this as sure. possible. She wants this to go all the way into 2023. And I don't know what she's bucking for, but it's just ridiculous that she got something new every other week about these folks. And, and, and you're right. Solve this thing. Mm -hmm. Let them plead guilty or whatever. I don't. I still don't believe they're going to get convicted if it goes to trial. Huh. I, I agree with you, man. I think I think it'll be very. They won't be acquitted. I said this from the beginning on this show. They won't be acquitted. I don't believe, but they. It'd be tough to convict them because it only takes one person, two people, three people, and you're going to get gun owners or people just have a different view of the world. And they're going to say, look, I, they, they, it's not criminal what they did. It's stupid what they did. They're assholes for doing it, but it's not criminal. I think that's a big problem for the prosecutor. So hmm. make a deal and get done with it. That's huh. my point. I think, you're, I think Adolph's right. There, she's definitely milking this. I mean, this is an ambitious politician. Um, and, you know, there's nothing wrong with that. The state of Michigan is filled, filled with ambitious politicians, but I think she's She's trying to, she's gunning for something down the road. And uh, yeah, you, you find me a politician who's not ambitious and I'll find you someone who's not a politician. Right. Exactly. <laughs> that's, yeah. That's, they're that's they're part and true. parcel. Okay. But, but I, I think it is. So first of all, the Crumblies, criminally responsible or not, the least sympathetic parents on the face of the earth. So I cry no tears for the Crumblies based on uh, the, uh, what we're led to believe was the help they offered a very troubled kid. But at the same time, you know, this is a newly elected prosecutor. 
as I understand, has never worked as a prosecutor, and she's taking on an unprecedented case. This is the kind of case that I think most prosecutors would say, let me get my best and most experienced team on this. Instead, she's front and center on this. She's doing national interviews. And as a reporter, let me just tell you, I think it's great that she's talking to the media. I think we should have more of this. But, sure. uh, but you have to question why she is at the, at the front of the line on this one. And I think Adolph is right that a lot of this is as much about her as it is about the defendants. And we're going to see in the end whether that's in the best interest of the people. But, uh, but this everything we're talking about came out in the Detroit Free Press in an exclusive report by Teresa Baldis. And what we're finding out one year down the road from this shooting is people who are on the school board at Oxford who have quit the school board to say what you're being told about this case isn't the truth. Now what you're seeing in these depositions is people who are in the school at the time the shooting happened telling people under oath what you've been told about this case isn't the truth. I'll just say as a reporter, as a parent, as someone who lives and breathes on the round earth, which a lot of people online don't believe is round, but we'll talk about that later. <laughs> we need the truth on this. And there's so much posturing going on in this with elected officials from the school district to law enforcement that to me, that's also a non-chargeable crime. That's just absolutely outrageous. We shouldn't be playing games and trying to score points with the death of our children and with let's not forget the people who were, you know, injured, who really are going to be wounded and damaged for the rest of their lives. Get the politics out of this shit. Let's get some justice. If it's done in a week, if it's done in a year, that's fine. But that should be the only thing driving anybody in this with ex the exception, maybe some of the civil attorneys who are. So, so you're saying that essentially the, the school board and the school administration, or not the board, the administration has their own reasons for wanting to keep the focus on the crumblies uh, because they don't want to talk about their role in all of this. I, 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 see. I don't know that the school board or the administration has an agenda, but it, it does seem from credible sources that uh, they're getting very different versions of what happened Yes. And to me, the agenda should be just to let us know what happened so we can figure it out and maybe prevent it from happening again instead of covering our ass or saving the insurance company a bunch of money. You know, I mean, that all that stuff, that ain't going to amount to a hill of beans when this place is just a cinder. Yeah. But if our kids keep getting killed because we're playing games instead of figuring out how to protect them, that's when somebody's going to end up burning in hell for the rest of their life. And I'll see them down there and I'll find them and I'll tell you who they are. <laughs> but I think Teresa, you know who they are. You're going to be Teresa, our, our hell bureau. That Teresa Baldus, she's a. Well, I think I've already jacket. been assigned there, so I'll try and do some good while I'm sweating my ass off. That Teresa Baldus is a crackerjack uh, reporter. I bet she's not high maintenance. Uh, Lengel, you were going to say something. That's the way you're wrong. But uh... <laughs> <laughs> the Oxford uh, school district. I mean, it's it's like on a smaller scale of what we see at Penn State, Michigan State, U of M. Cover up, cover up, cover up until it can no longer be covered up to protect the institution, to protect the jobs. Uh, it's disgraceful. And, and particularly at that small level, uh, at, you know, I, I, you see the universities getting away with it for a longer period of time, but eventually they don't. Uh, but to have it on a, a small, uh, you know, institution like that, like Oxford High School, for them to be able to cover up as long as they did is really just totally disgraceful. Steve? I, I think the one consistent thing, and I'm pretty sure you guys will all agree with this, when when Michael's talking about the facts coming out, they're, they're, they're coming out because of the lawsuit. I mean, Ben has been deposing these people. And when you make somebody stick their hand up in the air, we've talked about this many times here. They stick their hand up in the air. They're not so willing to go along with whatever bullshit it is that the, that the school board or anybody else is trying to say. It's the same thing with Doc Anderson with our case at, at U of M. Nothing really happened all of these years until then comes the lawsuit. Plaintiff's lawyers aren't necessarily the most loved people on the planet, but in situations like these, they really do a service to everybody. Obviously, there's money involved because that's why they're involved. But if you don't have those lawsuits, if you don't have things like that, then you're just not going to get the truth because people are not under oath when they're talking to the press or when they're standing out there giving, making a speech to the public. So it's just interesting to me that that all of these things, Penn State's another one, Every, all the things that you're mentioning, 
Michigan State, Penn State, our thing with Doc Anderson, this business here in Oxford, it really starts to come to the fore when lawsuits happen because people have to yeah. testify under oath. Mm -hmm. why, why hasn't the prosecutor charged some of these administrators who sent that uh, crazy kid back to class, didn't check his backpack, <laughs> didn't and knew that he was uh, dangerous? Now she jumped on the parents. Now you got to look at everybody involved. This might have not happened if they would have done their job. And they didn't do their job when dealing with this kid. That looks like that's going to be a question for the civil courts. Steve, yeah, sorry. Yeah, Adolph, that's exactly right what Nancy just said. That it, it, It'd be very difficult to charge any of the people that worked in the school, including the people you're talking about, criminally. But the civil lawsuit, they're defendants in the civil lawsuit, the, 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 the people you're talking about. And that's where they're going to be not out of their own pocket. It'll be whoever it is, the insurance company or the, the school district. But that's the only way. It's too extended. This this is charging the parents, as we all know, is, is a pretty unique move. But this is not something that happens all the time. And I think if you start going to the school administrators, it, it'd be almost impossible to charge them criminally. It doesn't mean you can't hold them responsible in a civil lawsuit, which is what's going on. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Let's move on. Um, another uh, high-profile criminal case um, is uh, beginning to unfold now, starting with a high-profile arrest in the Bahamas <laughs> of uh, cri crypto fraudster Sam Bankman Freed. Now, I'd like to start this little segment of the show by asking, does anyone have a definition of crypto, cryptocurrency that a lay person can understand? We're all smart people here. Go ahead. You know how they say a fool and his money is parted? <laughs> it's by crypto. Okay. In fact, <laughs> you know, I've, I've, I've been struggling to understand crypto since it kind of came on the scene. And I, I feel like a dog. I mean, somebody, somebody starts to talk to me about it. It's like the, the old Far Side cartoon. It's like blah, 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 blah. That's what it sounds like to me. It's just like, well, it's it's got this, you know, it's it's held in the blockchain. It's like I don't understand what the blockchain is, and that has to be explained. But it always sounds to me like magic beans because they tell me it's it's a form of currency, it's money, but at the same time, it's bought and traded on some sort of exchange, which is what FTX was, which is what Sam Bankman Fried was uh, dealing with. So I just I just don't understand it. And I have never been so glad that I never invested in cryptocurrency uh, when people were telling me that it was the, the latest thing. But um, this young man with his uh, crazy hair and everything else is now uh, has been arrested in the Bahamas and is going to be extradited to the United States and is going to face probably enough charges to put him in prison until his uh, unruly mop turns gray. But does anyone, I mean, I guess I want to start by just asking if anyone understands enough about crypto to understand what happened here, other than he made off, he made off I, the, yeah. the, a lot of people's money. I, the one thing I understand is to just stay away from it. Uh, <laughs> but, and the other thing is, as I was talking to a friend the other day, she was saying that, why did he have to be Jewish? Another Madoff. <laughs> Why? It's a Shonda for the Jews. He's got a hyphenated. He's got a hyphenated name, and both names are right. Sound right. very Jewish, you but yeah, put he, one he's... Gentile name in there, mix it up a little. <laughs> he was the uh, son of two Stanford professors, and so he was, you know, brought up in this, you know, highly intellectual world. I'm sure he learned to spin bullshit uh, with with the uh with the best of them but you know the the details that i read about this case when it first broke i just blew my mind um something about how he never never wears anything other than shorts and a t-shirt i think he did actually uh, do some congressional testimony and he wore a tie but they said he walked into his first venture capital meeting uh playing uh league of legends on his phone and refused to stop and everybody just fell over, tearing the seams of their pants, getting their wallets out fast enough or, you know, fast enough to, to just shower him with money for this FTX thing. And I just I still don't even understand what it is. So this is going well, to be an interesting case. Wall Street, I think, taught us 20 years ago 
that you can dress real good and still be a shifty asshole. So yeah. I don't want to <laughs> judge the man best on his apparel. But I think we've also seen quirky geniuses who seem weird may just be weird and not quirky geniuses. I bought $10 of crypto. PayPal had a deal where if you bought $10 of crypto, they would give you $10. Okay. So I basically recouped my investment. Sure. That crypto is now down to two ninety seven <laughs> because it has no value. It's not attached to anything. It's yes. not attached to uh, an asset. It's not attached. It's basically you put money in somewhere and you trust that the people who are putting money in there are somehow growing the value of it. I mean, it's the greater fool. How, how do you say. get the two ninety seven back? How do you cash I out guess, on that? I think I can sell it. I think it's like a stock where in theory it's worth uh, 297, but if I put it on the market and nobody gives me 297 for it, it's worth nothing. I gave you 50 cents. stock is backed by something. <laughs> I gave you 50 cents. I uh, 75. Sold. <laughs> what can you buy with it? Well, that's Adolf, I'm Broken so glad dreams. to hear you say that because that's what I would always ask people who are telling me you should buy crypto. I'm like Okay, so it's currency. So what can I buy with it? And all, the only answer anybody had was a Tesla because Elon Musk was really big on high on crypto and you could buy a Tesla with crypto at one point. But <laughs> he I, bailed on that, I think, because the other thing about crypto, one of the other wonderful things about crypto is everything is kept in computers. And so to keep these data uh, fields going, the crypto exchange consumes so much energy yes. that it actually has a, a seriously negative effect on the rest of us who aren't invested in crypto because it's just sucking up electricity. Right. Well, and apparently there are places in like Iceland, these, these uh, server farms, you know, where all of these that are just, and they always call it mining crypto that is, which I don't understand either. But that it's you know that's churning away, keeping this uh, keeping this this the magic beans uh, tumbling along in magic bean land, and you know, like you said, why do why are we spending? Why is it using so much energy that we could be directing to something more useful than to keep you know a bunch of rich assholes' rich dreams alive? So you're absolutely right. It's exactly like a Ponzi scheme, except they give you a statement. Yeah. What happens is you get in early and you get out on time and you're very happy. Right. Exactly. If you get in late or you hold it too long, you're very unhappy. Right. And whoever didn't recognize this as a classic Ponzi from the jump, yeah. well, guess hey, what? Don't what? don't don't uh, don't throw dirt on Ponzi. He wasn't that bad. Yeah. <laughs> okay, that's yeah. true. Yeah. He, know, he didn't contribute to global warming. The, the, the person who took over the company from from this guy was testifying and saying this was just a very simple fraud. He said basically he took investors' money and he spent it on personal his own personal things. He right. says there was nothing complicated about the fraud. Well, I'm I'm looking forward to the big short version of this that will maybe finally have an explanation of crypto that will stick in my brain. But I hope we, uh, yeah. And the whole idea you were talking about how it's backed by nothing. I mean, that was one of the arguments for crypto in the first place is, well, what is the dollar backed by? We're on, we're no longer on the gold standard. You know, you can't take your a uh, hundred dollar bill to Fort Knox and have them um, give you a hundred dollars worth of gold in exchange. It's, you know, so they call it fiat currency, right? Because it's just, but at the same time, if the entire world agrees what the value of a dollar is, that's, that's worth something. And it's not, I mean, we can't agree what, what crypto is worth other than $2 and 95 cents. So I'm glad that was a cheap lesson for you to learn. Um, no, I made 10 bucks. I, I guess I made $2 and 97 cents, but it wasn't from the <laughs> Crypto. Exactly. Right. 296. It's already down. Eight off. I right. need to get 50 cents as soon as you can get it over here. Yeah, exactly. All right. So we were <laughs> talking earlier. We were shit talking Charlie the Duff earlier, who's down, who was down at the border for a while. Um, the border is in the news again, and for good reason, because we no longer have uh people trying to sneak across in the dead of night and and you know disappear into the darkness on the American side to take some, 
you know, low paying landscaping job somewhere and in hopes of a better life. What we have now are thousands, thousands of people are crossing the border in full daylight and delivering themselves directly into the arms of the authorities on the Texas or the American side mm -hmm. and asking for political or asking for asylum, which is different from um, just plain illegal immigration. It, 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 they make their application and puts them into a kind of a twilight zone until these cases kind of, you know, go through the proper authorities. But um, what kind of problem is this? Is this it's the insane. Fox News? Is this the Fox News sky is falling problem or is it the CNN level? This is just a huge clusterfuck that we're going to have to figure out. Both. Ahead, Alan. I, I think it's both. I, it's horrific watching it. And, and, and really, when you see like the mayor of El Paso talk about it, the people in the town talking about it. I mean, how can any city, I mean, if people were coming from Windsor to Detroit by the thousands and just, you know, flowing into Detroit, we'd be freaking out. And it's, it's, it's mind boggling. I mean, it, Republicans and Democrats have to get their shit together and and figure this out because it's it's untenable to see what, what's what's and these are people there. who are generally fleeing not mexico but they're fleeing like um, everywhere so, uh, central the, central america venezuela and, we're South, seeing people exactly from they're South dealing and, and what yeah. they're dealing with or what they're running from is these criminal uh gangs that have taken over you know some of these cities down there um, a virtual standstill on any kind of, you know, job growth or any, I guess my feeling is most people don't want to leave their home and come here. I mean, or come and go anywhere else. I mean, as bad as, as uh, it would be if Trump was reelected or was elected again in 2024, it's something I would think about, but it was, but it's something I would think really hard about. And it's not anything I would want to do. People don't, people want to stay where they're comfortable and where they have family and roots. Why don't we put more effort into shoring up or cleaning up some of these um, these Central and South American, you know, cesspools that these people are fleeing from? Well, you know, I was just in Panama and it's just not happening uh, in the U.S. Uh, people from Venezuela and and Colombia they they come into Panama in, in droves. They because you know, Panama they, is. This is a more functional state. There's no question about it. And in a minute, Panama got their own issues with, with, with their own folks, but they're coming there. The, the, the ones that have money, they move into Panama because Panama is a tax haven uh, at a Panama city. But we, we got folks that they're just looking for places to go. U.S. is one of them, but all these islands, et cetera, people are fleeing uh, South America like the plague. There's hmm. no question we're going to have to do something about it. Otherwise, what's going to be left? Well, and this is also going to become more of a problem as climate change intensifies, if it does intensify, because people are going to find some of these, some places are not livable anymore. And the, I mean, it could even happen in the United States, you know, with these droughts out West and you have, you know, this wells running dry. I mean, you have to do something, you have to drink water, you, you have to move somewhere. It's entirely possible that if we all wait long enough, we will live long enough to see Michigan become the Saudi Arabia of water. <laughs> but, you know, it's a, it's terrible. I mean, the, the videos that I've seen of these, you know, these people with their, all their belongings they can carry and their children and everything else uh, coming in here and hoping for, you know, some sort of asylum program. It's, we have to respond to it somehow. And you build, you build a wall, you do something. <laughs> you can't keep people out. Right, well, just, what are you going to do then? Well, they, I was, I don't know. I mean, that's why I said, suggested maybe some, you know, informal nation building south of the border. In Florida, they let the Cubans in and they take the Haitians back. Right. We got, exactly. we got all kind of policies that we don't have one policy. Oh, I know. You're absolutely it, right. It, so, so it's chaos. Yes. And, 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 and it, the government is responsible for this chaos. And what, when the vice president supposed to be in charge, she just did a Houdini, a disappearing act. She's supposed to have been down at the right. border, et cetera. Right. Right. Uh, it, it, they got to do something. Yeah. 
I don't know what her presence down there would do other than just, you know, draw some news cameras, but, you know, there Symbolic, you go. at minimum. Symbolic. Okay. All right. Okay. How many MSU grads do we have on this panel? At least two. Elric and uh, what's, what is I think Fishman went there too. <laughs> I did go there. We went there. Well, three, three. I, I got a degree from Michigan State when I was in the fourth grade when we visited. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> you, you, you I'm know, telling Wanda about you, Adolf. Wait, am I am I on, on or off? Can you hear me? Yeah. I can yep. hear you, but your image is frozen. Okay, as long as you can. So, actually, it's a little different, Adolf. I like that one about you in the fourth grade. You get a degree, but what what I said. Uh, I got inducted in the Michigan Jewish Sports Hall of Fame about 20 years ago, and the MC was Judd Heathcote, who was a retired basketball coach. And then for some reason, Judd got up there, and all he was talking about was Michigan, Michigan, and basically saying that the students at Michigan are dumb, we, 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 the degrees don't mean anything, blah, blah, blah. So Izzo's there, Greg Kelser's there, there's a bunch of people from state. So when I get up, I start out by saying, look, Coach Heathcote, uh, it's made a lot of fun of Michigan's academics, which is really interesting because I'm telling him and I'm telling Coach Izzo and, and, and Greg, all you guys, if you really come to Ann Arbor, I tell you what you should do. Bring your Michigan State diploma. And I stopped. I said, and the reason is you can put it in your dashboard and you can park in a handicap zone. <laughs> <laughs> I like that one. Not, not saying it about Lengel or Elric, but, you know, just. Okay. I'm not sure yeah, why we're, was we're so some into, of the good ones, right, Steve? <laughs> yeah. I'm not sure why Heathcote was so into shitting all over Michigan, but I figured I'd give it back to him a little. You don't they get, did, they you did don't, get a good laugh. I'm <laughs> sure it did, yes. But all right, well, to be a little more serious, though, what's going on down there? Or what's going on in East Lansing now? They're, they're going through their own uh, dark night of the soul. They have... Um, there's been this uh, records uh, battle over the um, disclosure of the terms of Coach Tucker's contract and the role of the donors who are funding his, um, dare I say, bloated salary, given his record this last year. And then there's also uh, what's going on with the... Um, you know, with the uh, the board of trustees, which the Detroit News has been doing some good reporting about. There, I mean, is any any either of you two uh, alum alums concerned about this? Yeah, and I've, I've written about this for the Free Press. I am a Spartan. I'm a proud Spartan. I've served on the alumni board of my college at the university, but there's a problem at, at Michigan State that isn't being cleared up, and it it doesn't seem to have been affected very much by the scandal of Larry Nasser, and that's that they are continuing to play hide the football. Uh, they are not disclosing records that they should be re releasing. They're, they have a bunker mentality where it's come and get it, um, and that's just not good. Th those lessons should have been learned a long time ago. It doesn't appear that they were learned. Uh, when this Mel Tucker contract comes out, which we're led to believe it will be finally released next week, we may find out that there's absolutely nothing inappropriate in it, which I hope is the case. But at the same time, you shouldn't act like you got something to hide if you got nothing to hide. And I'm always nervous when people act like they have something to hide. Mm -hmm. But this is what happens to everyone who hides the truth, who won't face the reckoning of their actions or the actions of their friends or loved ones or, or co-conspirators. If you get a cut and you don't get it treated, it can lead to gangrene. And when it leads to gangrene, they can cut off all your limbs until the gangrene gets to your heart. And when it gets to their heart, there's nothing they can do for you. You're just going to die. Michigan state continues to not take tetanus shots to continue to get cut, to continue to not treat it. We've lost a couple of limbs and we're getting damn near close to losing our heart because you just can't keep going on like this because at some point the public says, what the hell is it going to take for you guys to learn? Now, I would suggest that some of the same thing is happening in Ann Arbor and at most of our colleges in terms of the athletic department and, and sexual assault and things like that. But I'll only speak for the Spartans. I'm sick of it. And uh, I'm going to continue to, to fight for the truth and try and reform the university. But at some point, they've got to get the lesson because we just can't keep going through this. This is not what universities are supposed to be about. This is I, not the ivory tower. This is the ivory outhouse. 
I agree. When, you know, any of these universities, Michigan State, Michigan, when you try to file a Freedom of Information Act, they always find an exception. They find a way to hide things. And they're public universities. They need to have transparency, and they don't. They run like we saw the, you know, the Catholic Church shuffling right. priests all around. It's all about saving the institution, about making sure people are still contributing money, about their image. Uh, they don't care about the people they serve as much as they do about the image and, and about getting donations. But so, at some I, point, I, though, let me, this let me hurts their up. image. Go ahead, Steve. No, no this, it's really a question for, for Elric and Lengel. Uh, do you guys think, at least this is as an outsider, you're just getting my information from reading the newspapers. It seems like going back to the days of Joel Ferguson as the chair of the hmm. Board of Trustees, it seems like the Board of Trustees don't work together. They have their own little groups or whatever, and they're always in conflict. And I don't see how you can really do the things that you guys are talking about when the trustees can't agree and they're in their own camps, et cetera. Every That's university, cool. every Wayne wait, wait, State. One more, yeah, one go, more ahead. Thing. go ahead. The second thing is, I think, Alan, you hit on it. I think the only way, you know, Elver can write 10 great columns about it. You can have Freedom of Information Act. You can have court rulings, blah, blah, blah. The only thing that's going to cause them to change, in my view, is if the large, large donors tell them, look, that's it. I'm sick of this. You guys are going to have to change your ways or you're not getting another penny from me. Yep. That seems to me to be the only way. And U of M is the same thing, too. That's the only way you can get into them is to do something about cutting off the money supply. That, that's my opinion. I'm interested in you guys' opinion. Hmm. No, I, I, I agree. I mean, it's it's all about I mean, people, you know, when you talk about Board of Trustees, I mean, we've seen at Wayne State, the, the infighting oh, on, my God, on the yes. Board of Trustees. We've seen it at Michigan State. We see it at Michigan, the infighting. The boards are not uh, necessarily operating in the, in the best interest of the universities there. There's, you know, politics, special interests like that. But I agree with Steve. I mean, Really, the big donors are the ones who have to demand that type of stuff. The people who have some influence over that, because apparently the public doesn't. And the media seems to have a limited influence on it. But we need to have the, the machers and, and all the con contributors who are, are saying, you know what, screw you guys. I'm, not, I'm done until you are more transparent and you have more integrity. So I, I'm going to take the opposite view on a couple of these points. I think the problem is the big donors are saying, don't let them see my contract. I think yeah. the big donors are the ones who say, you can put my name on that billing and do whatever the hell you want, but make sure you put my name on that <laughs> billing. Well, I think the big donors call way too many shots. And I think what's really going to happen is when people stop sending their kids there, that's, that's what's going to happen. And what I'm worried about there is the old principle is it's easier to keep a customer than get a customer. And once you start seeing people turning away from your university because they don't feel it's a place they can trust to send their kids to safely, or they don't want to be associated with it because the uh, diploma has a stain on it, then you're going to be entering a spiral that's very hard to pull out of. Uh, the other thing I'll, I'll say about the, the board is while you have – these governmental agencies sometimes that spend more time pissing on each other than trying to put out fires. That's definitely a problem. But I like boards where everybody doesn't agree because the problem we've seen in the past, at least at Michigan State, is they might not have agreed on a lot of stuff, but they agreed to cover their ass on some stuff and to bury some things. Yeah, right. And one of the best things about our de democratic system is it's an adversarial system. You have some people in power, you have some people out of power, you have some people on the on the right side some people on the left side and if you want to find out what the left is doing it's really helpful to ask the right and if you want to ask what the people in power are doing or not doing right you ask the people who are out of power so to have a board where everybody works in lockstep that really troubles me i think that's very anti-democratic but if people are fighting for the sake of fighting that's no good either but but, but give me give me a good board with somebody who feels like they're not having their voice heard because those are often the people who blow the whistle, sound the horn, raise the alarm. Those are my heroes. Yeah. Well, I always thought that the, uh, the people behind the board were the big donors. 
And and one day we probably see where a person like Bill Gates is going to be on your diploma, Bill Gates, University of Michigan. <laughs> Since Michigan is selling uh, football positions, quarterbacks, and all this other stuff and putting people names on it, uh, you and you look at the board. Now, when it comes out, who's who's calling the shot from Mel Tucker uh, contract? Now, if Mel Tucker uh, has another losing season, a couple years more in a row, who who says that? Okay, you can't fire him. Is that the, is that the donors or the board or or or, or the athletic director? Well, and that's part of yeah, that's part of the problem. I mean, I'm always, what I think that you know. ML, you're talking about it'll happen when, you know, people stop sending their kids there. But is that going to happen? This is a huge institution and it has a very large and devoted alumni base. I mean, did your kids go there? Do your girls go there? I don't know how old your daughters are. Now you're doxing me. Okay. Um, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. My, my oldest daughter graduated from there and my youngest is still going there. Okay. But, so see. But, no, enrollment's going up. Yeah. They're setting records, even with with all of this all this foolishness. Mm -hmm. So that's where, you know, I I think really, the only thing that's going to kill this bug is uh is all the sunshine we can pour onto it. And yeah. and you know one of the reasons why we can't find out more about university president searches is because Michigan went to bat to try and keep that stuff quiet. And and I'm not saying that to take a shot at Michigan. Um, Michigan State's like, yeah, we love that. Way to go. Yeah. You know, we're finally cheering for Big Blue. <laughs> These universities that take so much of our money are trying to act like a private corporation, and they're not. No. And they shouldn't. They shouldn't at and all. If you're worried about people not applying for the job because people will know they're applying for the job, well, first of all, that's kind of weird. And second of all, when you have these applicants for high-profile positions, most of the time, the people who find out the things that the people hiring really need to find out are from the public, from the media who does some investigations or people who know them and call them and say, hey, I just saw you're about to hire this idiot. Let me tell you something about my neighbor that you should know. You know, huh. he's got a bunch of cheerleaders buried beneath his back porch. I don't think you want to hire him as your university president. Well, putting to, work to, putting, putting to use the power of the people to vet these candidates, incredibly useful incredibly underappreciated and uh and and very democratic and i think that is a good trans a good comment to transition mm -hmm. to one more topic that i want to at least visit briefly which is um the revelation this week from dana nestle's office that a lot of the chat field investigation documents um are going to be kept secret or she wants to keep them secret essentially to stop embarrassing the, the other people who were involved in it, the um, various high-level lobbyists and um, mm. appointees and the Lansing Mafia, essentially, if you want to put it this way. I mean, that to me is appalling. You know, this is, I, I understand that people had to deal with Lee Chatfield because he was the Speaker of the House and, you know, you have to deal with the, with the people that you, you, you play the cards you're dealt, not the ones you want. But I mean, this just seems like a really um, self-serving uh, way to, to keep the public out of the loop when the public absolutely deserves to know everything about this particular investigation. Anyone? Well, I, I got a couple. I got a couple of thoughts on this and I want to say them before Steve, because I think Steve's going to say something that, that <laughs> is, is, is may clarify what I'm going to say. These affidavits are fantastic documents and I want one now, but, but here's kind of the problem with it. These affidavits name a lot of people who may or may not ever be charged. And we saw one search warrant affidavit or wiretap affidavit come out in the Macomb County public corruption scandal where the FBI, I think sincerely, disclose some information to a judge to get the authorization of the reauthorization of a wiretap where a dozen people were named and they were named as, as people who the feds believed were guilty of committing crimes or were involved in criminal enterprises. Most of those people were never charged. And some of those people later received letters saying, no, no, they're a good guy. 
I think the release of that wiretap kept Benny Napoleon from being our lieutenant governor because it put such a taint on him that Gretchen Whitmer didn't want to have that baggage when she put him on the ticket. So these affidavits are fascinating. They reveal a lot, but they can be incredibly damaging to the people who are named early who may in the not investigation be. who may never reach the tipping point of being charged. So, so, so that's the part I'd love to hear Steve on. But I'll also tell you this. If you don't think somebody's guilty of a crime, don't put their damn name in an affidavit. That's on law enforcement. Those affidavits need to come out because Steve's absolutely right. I can write 10 great columns. I don't know if I have 10 great columns in me, but whatever I write is not going to change anything because I've already written about this whole thing, about how we need to get to the bottom of this because this is about protecting people in Lansing. And the Chatfield thing, if they get to the bottom of it, there's going to be a lot of people who call the shots who are going to be dragged out in the sunlight and they sure as hell don't want that. And that's my concern about this. Who got to Dana? Okay. So, Go ahead, Steve. It, 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 it's interesting what, what Michael's saying is exactly true. It just so happens, and I can talk about it now, obviously. Uh, Benny and I have been friends for many, many years. And he came to see me exactly because of what Michael just talked about. Uh, there was carelessness at best on behalf of the FBI agent who was the affiant on, the, on, on those affidavits. And Benny wasn't the only person whose name was tossed in there. And I'm not talking about where, oh, he wasn't charged. He hadn't done anything. They had listened to a wiretap from somebody else and somebody mentioned his name or something like that. I've represented a half a dozen very well-known people who I'm not going to mention. Uh, who Bond, have been- Bond, Bonda Evans, I think name came I, up in there. I didn't represent Bonda. Yeah. I, 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 what Michael just said is exactly what can happen, and that's why it's very dangerous. If that's Dana's real motive, which who knows, if that's her real motive to protect the innocent, then that's fine. But if her motive is to protect donors or people who somehow have enough you know, clout to keep this stuff out of the thing, but you got to be very careful when you start looking at search warrant affidavits that are or affidavits in support of, of wiretaps if they're carelessly drawn. And uh, I don't know that you're ever going to be able to say to FBI agents, you can't put someone's name in there unless they're, you know, they're guilty or something like that. But you got to be careful, particularly when it's somebody like Benny or somebody else who's in the public eye already. Uh, it's, you know, so we'll find out hopefully eventually who the people are. But if the people didn't do nothing, it's very difficult to undo that. And yeah. you guys know because you're in that business. The that's why I requested for, for Benny, I've had about three or four successful times where the U.S. Attorney's Office sent me a letter that said that we're not pursuing any charges. And in Benny's case specifically, he was authorized, I was authorized to tell him he could say when he was in a press conference or something like that, look, we've been through that. I have... Permit, I have a letter saying I didn't do anything wrong or blah, blah, blah. That's something you got to be concerned with. Okay. All right. I think we have reached that time. Alan? Downtown Detroit. Robert Will, Smart of the Week. <laughs> <laughs> it is that moment in the show when we uh, try to find uh, one person who kind of sums up all of the bad stuff that happened in the past week. And who would like to go first? Uh, I'll go first. Hey, I'll, you know, go we start in the new year. We got uh, Senator Dianne Feinstein, who got dementia and any other things, about 90 years old and won't leave. I guess she's going to do a strong Thurman thing. They're going to have to carry out of the, uh, <laughs> the Senate. Uh, and why won't she retire? Where's Grandpa at on this? <laughs> That's a good question. Yeah. I think, and I think people have quietly tried to talk her into that. I think that people have quietly leaked to influential journalists just how bad off she is. But you can't, you know, she people keep voting for her. you. Can't uh, you can't you can't do anything about that. Where, but yeah. where is she on her term in terms of? Uh, I think I she mean, was just reelected. I think yeah. She, oh, yeah, 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 I think she was too. Oh, okay. There was a state senator from Detroit, and I don't want to name him in case I get the name wrong, who basically spent the last two years of his term in a care home because dementia had hit him so bad. This was 20, 30 years ago. Were well, you talking about Jackie Vaughn? I, I didn't want to say the name, but yeah, I'm talking about Jackie. <laughs> yeah, Jackie Vaughn had dementia. 
and, and, and people covered it up. Richard Austin had dementia, and, and Frank Kelly persuaded him to run for re-election, et cetera. You know, it's been there. If the they, staffs want it. The, if they the lobbyists have a staff, and the people who know they got to vote, they want to keep them there. If they have a staff that can cover for them, it's, it's not the, the disaster that sometimes it looks like. But California is a pretty important state, and I think it needs two senators who are definitely on the ball. Okay, Adolf, who's next? I'll go. Okay, Steve. I, I have three, though, but they're all tied up together. Okay. The names are Joseph Morrison, Pete Musico, and Paul Bellar. They're the three guys that got sentenced by Judge sure. Wilson yes. uh, for their involvement. And the reason that they're in my schmucks of the week, it's obviously they're schmucks just for the fact of what they did. But there were a couple of things that struck me, and I've talked about this before. A lot of these guys are really tough guys. They're so tough, blah, blah, blah. As soon as they get locked up, they're not so tough. So what happens? Mr. Musico, he blamed it. On a lapse in judgment. That was the phrase. I took it right out of the a newspaper. Lapse a lapse in judgment. A lapse in judgment is if you say two and two is five instead of four. Okay, a lapse sure. in judgment. That, that was his. And, of course, what did they all do? They cried and wept when they were in there getting sentenced. And that, to me, is the ultimate. If, if Guys like that, if I'm the judge, and I know Judge Wilson very well. He's a really good judge. I'm sitting there. You keep crying. And every time you're crying, I had another six months, another six months. <laughs> the crap that they did and the way they portrayed themselves. Wolverine Watchmen. We got every weapon known to man. But <laughs> God damn it, Judge, don't send me. I, mean, I can't go to jail. Well, they're my schmucks of the week, these three. All right. For being little bitches. For crying okay. like little bitches. Okay. You want to say it that way? Yes. All right. Fine. Uh, either one of you guys. Oh. Go ahead. Oh, okay. Michael. Uh, I'm going to pick, well, I got a couple, uh, Homeland Security, a report came out that there are 300 plus former and current members of the Oath Keepers who are our are, are Secret Service agents, ICE agents, Border Patrol agents. I'm thinking like, who is doing the vetting on this? There's supposed to be a vetting process here. Uh, if you're part of an extreme group like this, I don't know how, you know, particularly Secret Service where you write there with the president uh, at times. Uh, and then Marjorie Taylor Greene, who said, uh, talked about January 6th, she said, if she was involved, we would have won. <laughs> you, know. you know, in the, in the German, the, the arrest of the Germans last week, uh, several of those guys were in the military. So, yeah, yeah I mean, it's like there's a, there's a personality type that tends to flock to that, and it's very dangerous. It's always been there in the military. You, 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 you yeah. got a, a high percentage of uh, folks that's in the military. That that that's all the way to the right. And police too. There's as well. yeah. There's I mean, if you look at federal law enforcement, you know, FBI, DEA. There's a lot of former uh, military people. Yeah. Uh, part of that. All right, Elric. How about you? So um, this is going to be the subject of my column this Sunday in the Free Press. You can get a subscription for one dollar a month, by the way. That's right. Wow. Well, but money well spent. It's a, it's Senate Majority Leader, outgoing Senate Majority Leader Mike Shirky. He <laughs> went and talked about sticking his hand in the toilet. He talked about one world government. He talked about all this crazy shit that is not a threat to our democracy. But he is the man who kept. The, the legislature from once again addressing a real threat to our democracy, and that is the money and power in Lansing. Good for, for you. Terms now, four sessions, meaning eight years. Yep. The, the House, believe it or not, has sent legislation over to the Senate that would open up government, that would make the legislature and the governors, the executive branch, subject to the Freedom of Information Act. It would require lawmakers to disclose their personal finances and conflict of interests, this would help. It's not going to be a panacea, but this would help deter or help intriguing or intrepid people investigate and determine how much influence is being peddled in Lansing. This is a threat to our democracy. If anybody didn't believe that, Lee Chatfield once again rubbed it in our damn faces. Mm -hmm. And here's the Senate Majority Leader who would not get this up for a vote, not even in the lame duck we can throw whatever the hell sticks to the wall out there. Mm -hmm. Let it slide. And for 40 minutes, talked about a bunch of Yang. <laughs> Rock. Uh, these, he wouldn't, I'm not going to tell you who's in there. So it's like, well, who's in this group you're meeting with that's helping make all these policy decisions? You know, Mike Shirky, 
thank you very much for going to the White House and telling him Trump is crazy. I know that seems heroic, even though it's a pretty obvious move, but we got to give him that. Yeah. But for preventing the legislature from finally trying to take some measures to clean up its own house, you're my geek of the week or schmuck right. of the week or whatever. That's a good one. That's definitely a good one. All right, that leaves me. And uh, I thought somebody else would take this one, but um, it came to me uh, around 10 o'clock last night, and that is Elon Musk, who <laughs> in his uh, mismanagement of Twitter is now beginning to yank the, uh, the accounts of some very prominent and distinct and well-known journalists uh, for what he calls doxing. Uh, and what it is is, and what this seems to, his definition seems to be, for amplifying this one kid, 20, 19 or 20 year old college kid who had a Twitter that tracked using public information, tracked the uh, position of Elon Musk's private jet. And he considered that a threat to his safety. And he's totally full of shit on that. But, you know, this is the guy who's running the uh, probably the most important social network in the world. Right. So Elon, here we go. Elon, Elon Musk was also involved in trying to suppress criticism in China where he was doing business. And he's Mr. Freedom of Speech, and he's so full of shit. Freedom him. of speech, but don't say anything about me. Yeah, exactly. You know? Don't say anything bad about me. So right, anyway. Right. All right. Uh, so that, that with that, we're going to wrap it up. We're going to let everybody go. I know we're all busy people here. Thanks once again to Steve Fishman, Adolph Mongo, ML Elric, uh, I'm Nancy Derringer and Alan Langley. As always, you get the last word. Drive home.